um, will be um, in uh, three chapters. One is about putting things into perspective. Uh, the second one will be about recognizing opportunities. And the third one will be about the power of uh, compound uh, interest. And this is what uh, Alan Joe was uh, referring to um, at the very end of, of the discussion. Um, putting things into perspective. So this uh, first uh, chapter allows me to um, acknowledge the tremendous uh, discovery of uh, stem cells in um, 50 years ago uh, by these two Canadian researchers, Till and uh, McCulloch. And uh, Dr. Till unfortunately uh, passed away just a few uh, days uh, before um, the anniversary of this uh, important discovery. And only 50 years uh, after the discovery of stem cells are we, try are we st starting to harness the therapeutic potential of these cells for in regenerative medicine. 50 years ago also, JFK addressed the, the Congress on uh, urgent national needs, talking about sending the first man uh, to the moon. Only um, eight years later, the most important step of mankind was taken. Yet this uh, giant leap for mankind was of no um, help to the most fragile of mankind, the ones that we take care of. Patrick uh, Bouvier-Kennedy was born um, premature and died uh, two days um, later. The interesting thing is that uh, the obituary in the New York Times wrote that the battle for the Kennedy baby was lost only because medical science has not yet advanced uh, far enough. Yet, three years before that, and one year before Kennedy addressed the Congress on urgent national needs, a still unnamed white substance had been discovered in San Francisco by Dr. Clemens. And uh, I showed this slide earlier and you can see that the drug is a credit um, to a multidisciplinary team of uh, researchers that have allowed the translation uh, of these findings into the clinic, making it a major breakthrough in neonatology. The message of this slide is important. The question is very disturbing. The message is that it, takes, it took a multidisciplinary effort and several researchers to make uh, this uh, breakthrough happening. The disturbing question is, why does it take eight years to fly to the moon and 30 years to make a medication to, to save the lives of millions of babies? Putting things into perspective. Um, if uh, uh, Patrick would have survived, he may have developed the chronic lung disease that we are still um, fighting uh, today. And, uh, I showed the slide of the um, arrested alveolar development and why uh, BPD still exists. It's because of our improvement um, in uh, perinatal care that we have um, pushed back the limits of viability every five years or so, so that um, protecting the immature lung has become more and more challenging. And the long-term consequences of um, extreme premature birth are still unknown. I showed you the histology slide of a 12-year-old boy that had died from uh, um, an asthma attack, was arrested alveolarization, and uh, pulmonary hypertension in a young adult. This is another study showing, looking at CT scans of uh, young adults uh, that were born premature and had BPD. And you can see the dramatic emphysema in uh, this uh, one patient that was an ex-premature baby suggesting that um, there might be long-term consequences of extreme prematurity, as uh, Dr. Job just um, highlighted. So very clearly, we need to learn more about uh, normal lung development uh, and uh, how the alveoli develop in order to develop new treatment strategies um, to um, prevent lung injury or regenerate an already damaged lung. And uh, we talked about this in uh, the chapter of angiogenesis earlier this morning. Well, stem cells may actually allow us a shortcut 
not necessarily to understand how these mechanisms uh, lead to normal lung development, but directly tap into the therapeutic potential of, um, of uh, stem cells. What we already knew about lung injury resolution and repair was that in the distal lung, the alveolar type 2 cell represents probably a putative progenitor cells that upon injury transdifferentiate, repopulate uh, the damaged alveolar surface area and restore uh, normal homeostasis. And uh, with new insight into stem cell biology, we will be able to identify and characterize a little bit better this um, alveolar type 2 cell. What is a stem cell? A stem cell is, d is defined today as a cell that has the ability to divide for indefinite periods, often throughout the life of the organism. The interesting part that we would like to harness as clinician is that under the right conditions or give, given the right signals, stem cells can differentiate into many different cell types. That is, they can become mature cells and take the characteristics, shapes, and function of heart cells, skin cells, brain cells, or lung cells. Stem cells are schematically differentiated into embryonic stem cells and adult stem cells. The embryonic stem cells is supposedly the most pluripotent stem cells that can give rise to any type of cell in the organism. The most or the best described adult um, stem cell is the hematopoietic stem cells that gives rise to all the cells, the blood cells. Next to this bone marrow, okay. The, um, stem cells the stem cell field in the lung has really taken off after Diane's Krauss demonstration of uh, um, a hematopoietic stem cell, a single hematopoietic stem cells injected uh, into uh, an immunocompromised mice, that this cell could uh, give rise to epithelial tissue and engraft into epithelial tissue, as shown here in the distal um, alveolar epithelium. And this has really ignited the field of stem cell biology in the lung, harnessing uh, to see if we could harness these stem cells for therapeutic purposes so that Another mutually non-exclusive mechanism was um, proposed uh, for lung injury resolution and repair. Upon injury, the lung sends out a danger signal that will be transmitted to bone marrow-derived cells that will then home to the injured organ, here the lung, replace the dead cells, and restore the um, alveolar um, interface. And uh, Tim van Haften, a master's student that's now studying medicine in Ireland, uh, was uh, interested in uh, exploring this mechanism in the developing lung and the hyper hyperoxic-induced um, BPD uh, model. And uh, we were particularly interested in these mesenchymal stem cells that can also be found in uh, the bone marrow. These cells had been described in 76 by Friedenstein and he showed that these cells were plastic adherent, easy, easy to culture. Under certain conditions, they would become fat cells, bone cells, uh, or um, cartilage. But these cells ha have also been shown to cross lineage barriers, and they can become liver cells, brain cell, uh, muscle cells, and we wanted to see if they could also become lung cells. And so what Tim did in a series of in vitro studies, he first looked at the injury um, model of oxygen-induced uh, BPD and showed that these mesenchymal stem cells existed in the lung but were also uh, decreased in number. He also showed through in vitro experiments that these bone marrow-derived mesenchymal stem cells indeed home preferentially to the oxygen-induced lung. And in vitro, they could adopt an alveolar type 2 cell phenotype by uh, producing uh, surfactant protein um, C and by uh, uh, showing that uh, in electron microscopy, these um, differentiated cells had lamellar bodies, suggesting that they, they can become alveolar type 2 cell. But what does it mean in terms of um, um, their therapeutic potential in vivo? 
So what Tim did, he marked those cells, it was a green fluorescent marker, CFSE, and injected them intratracheally, just like we would give surfactant into this oxygen-induced BPD model in newborn rats. And you can see in red surfactant uh, um, uh, protein C uh, labeled cells. These are albuterol type 2 cell. And you can see that there are a few cells in the lung that uh, are green fluorescent, the mesenchymal stem cells that were injected. And when we do co-staining um, um, uh, of these um, cells, uh, we can see that uh, these uh, green cells also express surfactant protein C, the typical granular expression suggesting that some of these mesenchymal stem cells from the bone marrow that have been injected into the lung adopt a type 2 cell phenotype. In terms of uh, therapeutic potential, Tim shows that bone marrow-derived MSCs significantly improve the survival of these animals as compared to untreated hyperoxic uh, rats or rats treated with pulmonary artery smooth muscle cells that we had taken arbitrarily as um, uh, control cells to show that the effect is due to the bone marrow-derived MACs. Then when um, he has those uh, rats run on a treadmill, that should be a movie, but because I forgot my cable in the hotel, we can't see the movie. But the, the important message is that um, these bone marrow-derived mesenchymal stem cells improved significantly <laughs> exercise capacity uh, in uh, the treated animals as compared to untreated or um, control cell treated animals. More impressively, when we inject um, these cells, we see a dramatic prevention of um, arrested alveolar development in this model with bone marrow derived um, stem cells compared to untreated animals or animals treated with the control PA smooth muscle cells. These animals, I said earlier, they also develop hypertension. We can assess that with the right ventricular hypertrophy. You can see here um, in right ventricular hypertrophy in untreated animals. We also can do pulmonary ar artery acceleration time with echo Doppler. And uh, we can show that with uh, bone marrow-derived stem cells, there's a de decrease in right ventricular hyper hypertrophy and improvement in PAAT. Likewise, there's arrested angiogenesis in these animals, and at least um, um, subjectively, it looks like bone marrow-derived MSCs also promoted lung angiogenesis. I will show you quantitative data later on. But as an interim summary, we can say that adult bone marrow-derived MSCs migrate preferentially to the injured lung. They adopt a lung phenotype. They can be given intratracheally, similar to surfactant, they engraft into the injured lung, improve survival, and prevent arrested lung growth. As neonatologists, an intuitive source of uh, stem cells is human umbilical cord blood. And indeed, for us, it's very clinically relevant. A 100 million birth uh, rate worldwide also suggested it's a largely untapped source of stem cells. These cells have supposedly strong reparative potential, uh, more so than adult bone marrow-derived stem cells, and they are devoid of ethical dilemma compared to embryonic stem cells. And together with uh, Maria Piero and uh, her um, team in, in, in Milano, um, we worked on uh, cord blood-derived mesenchymal stem cells and uh, cord blood-derived uh, pericytes. That's the camel, that's Maria, by the way. She should never have given me that picture. <laughs> so we were very interested in these two types of cells, um, especially that these pericytes had been described uh, just recently as being precursors of mesenchymal stem cells. And the interesting aspect of these pericytes is their location. On these beautiful electron microscopy pictures, you can see that those cells, they just uh, sit uh, in the vicinity of the vessels so that they can respond much faster uh, to a danger signal as opposed to cells that have to come all the way from the bone marrow. And so what Maria did in migration experiments, she um, assessed the migration potential of these pericytes in response to just regular culture media, DMEM, a normoxic undamaged lung or hyperoxic lung. 
And we can see that those parasites, similar to what Tim had shown before with bone marrow derived MSCs, migrate preferentially in response to an oxygen injured lung. This oxygen injured lung, compared to the norm oxy control lung, also um, produces higher levels of SDF1 alpha or stromal derived factor 1, which is a uh, well known homing um, factor for stem cells. And when she performs the same migration experiments, but this time with SDF1 alpha in the lower chamber, we can see dramatic um, migration in of these parasites in response to SDF1 alpha, suggesting that these cells somehow contribute to um, lung repair. Similar to uh, Tim previously, Maria injects those uh, mesenchymal stem cells or the parasites uh, prophylactically at P4 in these newborn rats. And, you can see, and then she performs uh, lung function, and you can see that control animals that were housed in room air, real room air, not like the um, patients that are ventilated, um, these uh, um, animals um, had uh, no impairment in lung function, dramatic decrease in lung compliance in our hyperoxic BPD model, and an improvement with MSCs and parasites from human umbilical cord blood. When you look at the lung architecture, there's the rest in alveolar development with O2-induced BPD, improvements with MSCs and parasites, and no adverse effects of MSCs and parasites on uh, lung architecture in normal animals. Then Maria took it one step further, where she exposes those rats to two weeks of uh, hyperoxia. And once the lesion is established, then she injects the stem cells intratracheally. You can see again the dramatic arrest in alveolar development. This is now at uh, 28 days uh, of life. And MSCs and parasites injected at P14 re restored alveolar um, development. Then Maria looked at the long-term effects of, uh, or safety and efficacy of these uh, cells because of the maybe legitimate uh, um, risk of uh, tumor formation. So she did um, whole CT scans on these um, animals and couldn't see any um, suspicious uh, pictures. This is just an infarcted um, vessel. She did again exercise capacity in these animals, and you can see the dramatic reduction in exercise capacity in these now six month old rats. Whereas the ones that were treated six months earlier with MSCs and parasites had significant, uh, significantly better exercise capacity. And as we saw before, there's this persistence of the arrest in alveolar development in oxygen induced BPD animals, similar to what we saw on the CT scans or the histology of this 12-year-old boy that died of asthma. And we can see the persistence of the beneficial effect on lung architecture of mesenchymal stem cells and parasites, and again, no adverse effects on lung architecture in uh, control room air animals. So in summary, cord blood-derived reparative cells can be given intratracheally, similar to um, routinely used surfactant. They engraft also in, in the injured lung. I haven't shown these data, but they do. They prevent oxygen-induced lung injury. More impressively, they rescue established oxygen-induced alveolar growth, and they show long-term efficacy and uh, safety. One um, result, however, was, uh, was puzzling. How do you reconcile the therapeutic benefit uh, of uh, these stem cells with low engraftment if we assume that cell replacement is the main mechanism by which these cells exert their beneficial effects? So other researchers in the cardiac field and the brain field had already suggested that these cells may not act by cell replacement, but rather through a paracrine effect. And these are experiments that were done by Rasheen Byrne. She was a master's student. She's now um, doing medicine in Calgary. And what Rasheen did, she cultured those bone marrow drive mesenchymal stem cells, just as we did before. And then instead of uh, taking the cells, she took the supernatant of the cells, or the conditioned media. And then she did a series of experiments showing that when she applies this conditioned media, not the cells, just what they produce, 
uh, to alveolar epithelial cells exposed to hyperoxia, she could prevent uh, apoptosis and maintain proliferation of these cells in the hyperoxic environment. When she seeds those cells in a petri dish and does a wound healing assay, she could show that uh, those um, epithelial cell wounds healed faster with conditioned media compared to regular condition, uh, compared to regular culture media. And likewise, when she does a um, microvascular endothelial cell cord formation assay, uh, in hyperoxia, these endothelial cells don't form cords, similar to the, uh, to the rarification and angiogenesis in, in the lung in vivo. But when she applies the conditioned media, she promotes capillary network formation in vitro. And Maria um, took the conditioned media of her cord blood-derived mesenchymal stem cells and cord blood-derived pericytes and confirmed these experiments in vivo, showing improved angiogenesis, improved lung architecture compared to untreated animals, and, uh, well, increased angiogenesis here uh, quantified. And then she looks also at the long-term safety and efficacy of the treatment with umbilical cord blood derived cell conditioned media. So not the cells, but just what the cells produce were given to these rats. No suspicious images on total body scan, improved exercise capacity, persistence of the beneficial effect on lung architecture. So contrary to um, what that schematic showed initially, where direct cell replacement or uh, cell differentiation uh, leads to um, alveolar repair, we believe that these cells, they migrate indeed to the lung, but then they sit there and secrete um, bioactive molecules that contribute to lung injury resolution. They modulate inflammation, they protect from alveolar epithelial cell deaths, and allow those um, cells then to uh, repair the lung once uh, injury uh, has, uh, has vanished. And these cells act probably through this pyrocrine effect, which is the power of um, uh, compound uh, interest described by Albert Einstein. And Paul Vaschak, he wanted to harness the, furthermore, the therapeutic potential of this conditioned media. What he did, what he called preconditioning of mesenchymal stem cells, and we talked about preconditioning earlier in this meeting, he exposed these uh, MSCs uh, before injection to high oxygen concentration, preparing them basically for the milieu that they will then encounter in vivo. And then he takes the conditioned media of these MSCs and injects them. And he shows that in terms of lung architecture um, pr protection, preconditioned mesenchymal stem cells had a ben uh, had an higher benefit than mesenchymal stem cell conditioned media that was not preconditioned with uh, hyperoxia. This is an attempt of uh, summarizing six equivalent women years of work in 30 seconds. <laughs> so Rasheen um, took her conditioned media of bone marrow derived mesenchymal stem cells and injected it into an LPS induced ARDS model. You can see the dramatic uh, um, lung injury produced with LPS injection and the dramatic prevention of lung injury uh, when she injects the conditioned media four hours after the LPS and the dramatic reduction in lung neutrophil influx with uh, bone marrow derived condition media. Juliana, an MD from um, um, Colombia, South America, who did her PhD in our lab, showed that in a bleomycin induced fibrosis model, a uh, horrible disease that uh, um, leads to death in three to five years after diagnosis, shows that bone marrow, uh, cord blood derived cells injected in this bleomycin induced uh, mouse model prevents fibrosis, decreases lung collagen content, and significantly improves exercise capacity in these animals. And then finally, Lavinia, using an 
Ovalbumin-induced asthma model shows that she can prevent with the condition media the remodeling of ovalbumin-induced uh, um, airway remodeling and improve lung uh, function and restore the blunted response to salbutamol in, this, in a chronic asthma model. Who, uh, who, who do you think is one of the greatest inventors of our times outside of science today? <laughs> Someone, inventor. You're using his uh, equipment in the second row, iPad, iPod, Steve Jobs. Steve Jobs, he's well known for, well, his innovative spirit, but also for his uh, quite uh, convincing introductions and presentation of his new products. And uh, when he presented the iPhone, you would think that, okay, what can, what, ha can he be, what can be new about cell phones? They have been around for over 15 years, right? And so he presents um, his uh, iPhone as he says, it's a phone, it's an iPod, it's an internet browser, it's a phone. And he gets the tremendous applause of his audience. Well, stem cells, I showed you, it's an anti-inflammatory, it's an anti-fibrotic, <laughs> it's an antioxidant. It's an anti-inflammatory, and so on and so forth. <laughs> Thanks, good crowd. <laughs> so, in conclusion, these cells, because of their pleiotropic effect, may be a major, a major, a magic bullet for this multifactorial disease. I showed you that stem cell-based therapies prevent and rescue arrested alveolar growth. Cord blood-derived MSCs and pericytes um, show structural and functional benefit in the short and in the long term. And I showed you that cord blood-derived endothelial colony forming cells have the same therapeutic potential. So some of the remaining questions are, what is the best reparative cell? And what is the optimal cell-based strategy? Should we use the cells? Should we use what, the, what they produce in the conditioned media? Should we isolate these factors, purify them, and give them as medications, in which case we would lose the compound interest? Should we enhance their homing to the injured organ? Also, we have to carefully assess the short and long-term safety and efficacy and further understand the mechanism of their therapeutic benefit, because this may lead to even better um, therapeutic options. So this is what we can do today in the lab. Harvest the cord blood-derived cells, inject them into animal models, and prevent or regenerate the damaged lung. This is what we would like to do tomorrow. Take the stem cells uh, of our babies, inject them at a, give at a given time point to prevent or uh, restore uh, the injured um, BPD lung. Let's just make sure that uh, it doesn't take another 30 years like surfactant. Thank you. Good, these are all the people that have contributed to that work. I presented uh, most of them. Gaia preceded uh, Maria on the Italian project with cord blood derived uh, stem cells. And Adam Hall was a summer student who also contributed to um, the studies with the LPS induced uh, model. Any questions? You shall answer for that long. It's a beautiful effect. Do you think it would be for different um, tissues like brains or yes. uh, intestines? Yes, so um, uh, studies have been done in the um, 
in the heart, myocardial infarct. Uh, studies have been done with um, uh, spinal cord injury. Um, and um, these cells basically teach us how the body heals itself, right? And um, if we can give them exogenously in whatever form this will be, uh, they will have um, effects on different, um, on different organs. And um, Alan Job said that uh, few glomeruli predict hypertension later in life. In this uh, O2-induced BPD model, they have actually reduced uh, uh, numbers of nephron. Uh, when we look at the animals that were treated um, intratracheally with stem cells, they have preserved the number of nephrons. And so likewise, you can argue that uh, maybe uh, there might be some systemic beneficial effects on the brain as well. And um, all these uh, cytokines that float around uh, and affect maybe brain development, uh, maybe the um, stem cells through their pyocrine activity uh, may have a protective effect. So the brains of these animals sit uh, in Paris in Pierre Gressin's uh, lab waiting to be analyzed. Over there. Oops. How could anything with so many pleiotropic effects not have toxicity? So, I mean, this stuff is a little about, bit like steroids. Right. It does everything to everything. Exactly. So, so, I w so, so, so the, 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 the implication when you have so many things affecting systems is that something has to go awry. Yeah. So, so I thought about that exactly the same way. I said, okay, um, steroids have the same pleiotropic effects. Retinoic acid have pleiotropic effects. How is that different? It might be that these cells are really the, the repair cells of our body spontaneously. They migrate to the, um, to the damaged um, organs and they um, do what they're supposed to do. And so, here, I think uh, we give these cells um, maybe the repair mechanisms of the lung in this BPD model are overwhelmed. By giving additional cells, they come, they sit, they look at the environment, and they say, oh, here we need a little bit of angiogenic growth factors. Here we need to attenuate damp and inflammation. They do what they're supposed to do. And um, could it go awry? Um, Actually, there's a very interesting uh, paper by a group uh, from um, Ann Harbor where they showed that uh, the mesenchymal stem cells that one can extract from the tracheal aspirate of infants with BPD actually have a spontaneous propensity to turn into, fibro uh, into fibroblasts, and they respond to TGF-beta dramatically by proliferating and spitting out profibrotic factors. If you do the same experiments with cord blood derived MSCs, they don't behave the same way. But again, we need to mo know more about uh, the, these cells and, and the mechanism of, of, of repair. Bernard, I'm almost speechless by this whole thing, which is pretty unusual for me. Um, I, so let's just think you, you're going to put some cells in to an injured lung. They have to perform, produce type 2 cells, type 1 cells, endothelial cells, mesenchymal cells, get rid of all the collagen and the fibroblasts that have been deposited. So it's not just a matter of repairing the epithelium. They've got to do everything. Yeah. And the slides that you showed, look at how that happens. So, I mean, you, but you also, look, we can turn them into alveolar cells, right. but will the same stem cell go, different sorts of alveolar cells, get rid of the abnormal uh, collagen, get, et cetera, et cetera? Yeah. Can, will they do all those things? Yeah, so when, when we designed those experiments in the beginning, we really thought that, yes, they would do all these things, replace the dead cells, endothelial cells, epithelial cells, and restore a normal lung. But the cell, this, the cell engraftment is so low that we, we don't think that this is happening. And Vivek Balazubramanyam in Denver, he, he did, I think, so far the most careful characterization of, of lung engraftment. He used another type of cell, bone marrow 
angiogenic cells, he calls them. And when he looks carefully, if these cells become alveolar type 2 cells, they don't. He looks whether they become endothelial cells, they don't. Mm. Whether they become fibroblasts, they don't. When he looks at where they are, they sit in the basement membrane, a few of them. They sit in the basement membrane, almost inert. At least they mm -hmm. didn't take up any um, um, uh, protein or express any protein that are known to be expressed by these cells. So we think it's, it's really a pyocrine effect. And, uh, um, and uh, the surprising thing was that um, they restored alveolar development after established lung injury, after two weeks. Um, whereas when we do the same in the fibrosis model, this is not happening. We can prevent the fibrosis, which is still clinically relevant, but we cannot reverse established fibrosis. We have some ideas how we could do that. It's, it's a bit uh, um, futuristic, but uh, who knows? We have to do it. And, um, and, um, but the effects are there in other animal models as well. So we use the asthma model, as, uh, well, actually all the models, fibrosis and, and LPS, and this has been done by others as well, and they show a, a therapeutic benefit. The question is, uh, can this be, is this true in a model that is closer, that mimics closer the clinical situation, like the baboon model, for example? And so we're, we're, we're trying to resuscitate this, this model and uh, see if um, uh, we get the same therapeutic benefit. That would be, I think, a very strong statement uh, and the rational for clinical trials. But they're already happening in Asia, so. Thank you, Bernard. A wonderful talk. Um, since uh, it seems clear from your studies and, and studies also done in brain and other organs that it's not the cell itself, but what the cells are secreting in response to stimuli, is there any benefit to combining um, conditioned media from different cell types together to create synergistic um, responses? Because you're not only dealing with repairing endothelium, but you're trying to repair. There are many, many cell types that right, you're trying to right, get Right, right, right. And then get more toxic. Uh, um, so the beauty about these MSCs is that they are easily uh, culturable, easily extracted, or just very easy to work with. They produce VEGF, they produce adiponectin that seems to mediate the beneficial effect in the asthma model. They produce angiotensin-converting enzyme 2, which uh, is now in clinical trials for ARDS. Um, they also produce VGF and angiogenic growth factors. So they promote angiogenesis, they, they protect alveolar epithelial cells. So these cells, they do all these things. Um, we um, also have data on angiogenic, uh, on endothelial progenitor cells, uh, and they have the same benefit. Uh, I think uh, different um, diseases may benefit from different types of stem cells. I could see the endothelial colony forming cells very useful in pomy hypertension, for example, uh, whereas the MSCs, they seem to be more pleiotropic. They could be beneficial in a multifactorial disease uh, such as BPD. Yeah. I, I would, as Alan, as Alan Job, <laughs> as Steve Job says, I would keep it simple. He, he, he designs those computers to be used by bozos, right? That's how he calls them. Bo anyone can use them because they are so intuitive. Why, why does everyone buy them? Because it's just so simple. If you want to do something that will be used in the clinic as well, you have to make it as simple as possible, such so as surfactant. Liquid ventilation is complicated, appealing but complicated. Continued about cell types. Uh, what do you know? What do you think about amniotic um, fluid in stem cells? 
That's yeah. why even because it's yeah. being, being serious yeah. and joking, it's what lungs are filled in. Yeah, very good. Fine. So amniotic uh, fluid stem cells have also been shown to have some uh, therapeutic benefit, actually in the same model. It's not published yet. Uh, it's a group in Padova. And um, uh, again, it comes down to what is um, clinically feasible and simple. Cord blood is increasingly stored anyway. Uh, it is discarded usually, it's, but it's easily accessible. Amniotic fluid, how do you get the amniotic fluid? Who gets an amniotic uh, an amniocentesis? Are you really going to use these cells? Yeah, so these are questions, practical questions that you have to answer, right? Intellectually, maybe interesting, but practically, <coughs> I don't know, but lots of people are pursuing that. So just to give credit to other people as well, because that reminded me there's a group in Australia that uh, uses amnion epithelial cells. And uh, they use a um, LPS-induced uh, uh, lung injury model, similar to Alan Jove's, and they show that they can attenuate inflammation uh, and maybe lung injury in, in these animals. So just to show that in a different model, it seems to work as well. Any other questions? How long do you think will it take to get into the clinic? <laughs> 10 years? 10 years? Who's for 10 years? Well, the problem with it is it's a little like aspirin. Uh, we don't know how it works. I mean, we sort of know how it works. But it's the same sort of a problem that, that basically you're using a multiple component system, be it a cell or the media. And you don't really know how it works because you don't know what the components are. Right. And the FDA doesn't like mixtures. Exactly. And they don't like not knowing why something might work. Now, often they approve drugs lots of times that people think they know how they work, and then they use them for something else, like Viagra, for example. Exactly. But, but it is a problem for drug development. Exactly. So that's, that's why the, there's this dilemma. Should we use the, the cells because they produce those substances and they know, uh, they know what, what to do, what to produce? But then there's the risk of tumor formation, even though we don't show that uh, at least at six months they don't have any tumors. Or do we use what they produce, feeling safer about it, but then we don't know what's in there? And now if we get asked to identify these factors, then we're looking at another 30 years, right? And then once we identify the factors, then we have to come up with the, with, with the, the, the best cocktail that has the best therapeutic benefit because it's not just one factor. It's that compound interest that's so powerful. We need a new... Yes. Uh, <laughs> well, I mean, with systems biology, right, uh, maybe they will uh, help us to, to solve this uh, problem faster, but, uh, yeah. Okay, thank you.